We're in the letter of James, and we will begin reading in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by, and by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messages and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Every religion in the world other than biblical Christianity Every religion, whether it calls itself Christian or whether, it has, whether it's a thousand miles from Christianity, every religion other than biblical Christianity teaches that a person is saved through some combination of faith and works. Faith in whatever God it is that they have and works. They, you gather merit. You gather points. And if you get enough points, you will make it to heaven. Um, of course, they never tell you how many points it is, so you never know if you've reached that goal. And you, you, so you can never know if you're in a right relationship to God. You just have to wait and die and find out then. Um, but the Apostle Paul deals with people who think that they can be saved through their works. And he says to them, no, uh, you're not saved by your works. You're saved through faith alone in Christ. If you were saved by works, that would mean that God would owe you. You've worked for it, and therefore God is um, obligated to give you salvation, because you worked for it. And he says, no, salvation is by the grace of God alone, through Christ. Now, even though all the other religions teach some kind of form of faith plus works, which is an error, uh, many evangelicals who understand that you're saved through faith go in the other direction. And they say, well, since I am saved through faith and not by works, I don't need to do works. And they basically fall into what, uh, what we call antinomianism. Uh, that's a big word. It's not difficult. Antinomianism comes from two Greek words. Adi, which means against, and nomos, which means law. Against the law. Antinomianism. So what they basically say is, well, since I'm saved through faith and not by works, I don't need to obey the law. I don't need to follow God's laws. I don't need to do good works. It doesn't matter because I'm saved by faith. And these are the kind of people that James is dealing with. The people who are saying, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the gospel. But there is no change in their lives. They, they, they don't try to be obedient to God, they don't try and follow God, they don't have any good works. And James's point, in case you missed it, which he repeats three times, verse 17, faith without works is dead. Verse 20, faith without works is dead. Verse 26, faith without works is dead. A true and living and saving faith is manifested through works. Um, now, before, unless we misunderstand what James is saying, he is not saying to us, you've got to do more good works. You've got to do more good works. He's not saying, well, if you have a dead faith, you've just got to do more good works, and that will make your faith alive. That's not his point. You don't take a dead faith and just stick works onto it, so that's going to save you. No. But his point is, if you say you have faith and you don't have works, careful, 
because maybe you don't have real faith. That's what he is warning us about. A few years ago, I was in a theology class. And before we began, the professor said, Let's, what should we pray about? And I remember one of the students who said, We need to pray for my brother. He's in jail again. He, I don't remember, he's drunk driving or drugs or something. I, I don't remember what it was. And he was like, yeah, he's been, I don't know, he's like 30 years old now. He's been in and out of prison for the past 15 years. You know, his life is a big mess. Now, I know that he's saved. I know that he's saved because when he was 14, he made a profession of faith. But his life is in a big mess. Now, don't get me let, me, let me qualify so that you don't get me wrong here. Christians sin. We have all probably already sinned today. <laughs> some believers can fall into some serious sin for a while. Look at, look at David who committed adultery and then had the woman's husband killed. Okay? But even when we do fall flat on our faces. If you truly have faith, if God has truly saved you, He will bring you back. He will grant you repentance as David was brought back after Nathan went and said, we know what you did. In Philippians 1.6 it says, He who began a good work in you, keep in mind salvation is the work of God, He who began a good work in you will finish it. Even when we mess up along the way. So I'm not saying Christians can't sin. But 15 years and nothing? He made a profession. And no desire for Christ. No following Christ. No, just sin and uh, breaking the law and everything. Now I don't know about the man's brother. I never met him. But I was just wondering what would James say? If someone said, this person is a believer, I know that, but never shown any spiritual life. I think James would say, faith without works is dead. Let's look at the passage. See what he has to say. Starts off in verse 14. He says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, there's the key word, says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? So if someone says he has faith, he has a profession of faith, but there are no works, there's no result, there's no holy life. We have two billion people in the world who say that they're Christians. One out of three people, approximately, in the world. Wouldn't the world be a wonderful place if one out of three people were Christians? 95% of the population of Greece say that they're Christians. Do you think that over 9 out of 10 people that you meet on the street are Christians? Wouldn't Greece be an amazing place to live if 95% of the people were Christians? Yet you have all these people who say that they're Christians, yet most of the time they live like the devil. And James says, can faith save them? Can faith save such a person? Now keep in mind when he says faith... He is referring to the faith that he just mentioned. Someone who says that he has faith, but there are no works. We're talking about a mere, empty profession of faith with no holy life behind it. Can that kind of faith save him? And the answer that he's expecting you to say is no. If you read it in the Greek, it's pretty plain. He's basically saying, that faith can't save him, can it? No. No, it can't. There is such a thing as a faith that does not save. Um, in Matthew 7, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. He's giving us a description of the person who is saved. He's giving us a description of the person who enters the kingdom of God. And he says, it's not just the person who says, Lord, Lord. They have a profession of faith. They call Jesus Lord. They're not doing anything. Simply because you say you're a believer does not mean that you're a Christian. A Christian is a person who does the will of the Father. He brings an example. 
in verse 15. He says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what is it profit? He says, A brother or sister come in, so we're talking about fellow Christians now. And it's assumed that you have the ability to help them. And they're naked or hungry. And you say, be filled, be warm, go in peace. Sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? Peace be upon you. Your mouth is saying that you care, but you don't do anything. So that means that you don't really care that much. Uh, he's talking about a person who says something, but doesn't do anything about it. Like in chapter 1, what was he uh, telling us to do? He was saying, don't be hearers of the word, only be doers of the word. Simply having a profession of faith and not doing anything about it doesn't help. If my faith in God does not result in my worship of God, something's wrong. If my faith in God does not result in a changed life, one that wants to conform to the will of God, something is wrong. Look, if you've got two people, one of them says he has faith, the other one says he does not have faith. And they live the same way. Who cares that the one says that he has faith? doesn't make any difference. Who cares? And so in verse 17 he says, Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's like a dead tree that has no fruit. What good is it to have a fruit tree which does not produce fruit? Might as well cut it down and throw it in the fire. Verse 18. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Someone will object and say, well, you know, I have faith, you have works. Some people have faith, some people have works. You don't have to necessarily have both. And James says, really? Um, show me your faith without works. Show me. Um, well, I, I, I have faith. Okay, yeah, I can hear you saying that. But show me. Prove it. Without works, it can't be done. It, it, it can't be done. James is asking for a demonstration of faith. And it can't be done without works. <laughs> without a Christian life. And he says, I will show you my faith by my works. It's the only way to show that you have faith. is to demonstrate it through works. Now, again, so that there is no misunderstanding here. Because um, James is not when when James is saying, "Show me, show me your faith," he is not saying, "Well, you need to seek the approval of men." Okay, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying, "Well, that's what matters. You need to seek the approval of men. As long as they see your faith, that's good enough." Uh, no, we need to seek the approval of God, obviously, and only God. But when we seek to be obedient to God and follow His will and obey Him. Our lives will become visible to the people around us. People will notice that your life is different. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, "Let Listen to these words, it's, it's important. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Okay? The goal is not for people to pat you on the back and say, Wow, look at those good works, you're so great. The goal is the glory of God. The, the goal is for people to see that and say, okay, yeah, his God is great. His God has changed them. His God has made him different from what he used to be. The goal is the glory of God. And so we're not saying, well, we want the, the praise of men. But if you do obey God, that will show. It will become visible. And James is basically saying to this hypothetical person, why don't I see it in your life? You say you have faith, but I don't see it. Something's wrong. Think of a person that you believe to be a Christian. Think of a person that you're, you're like, I believe that this person is a Christian. Why do you think that? Is it because he said so? Or is it because of his life? Is it because of the way he lives his life? Is it the way he 
deals with trials and temptations? Is it because of the way that he uh, deals with tragedy? Is it the way that is his life? Di- his life is different from what it used to be. It's different from the rest of the world. That's why you think he's a Christian. Look at verse 19. He says, "You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble." The person is saying, I believe in one God. Uh, This is probably a reference to um, Deuteronomy 6, the famous Shema. uh, I learned it once in Hebrew. It's something like Shema Yisrael Yahweh Elohim Yahweh Echad, which means, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So this is probably a reference to that. He's talking about a person who confesses the true faith, I believe in the one God. Okay? So he has orthodox faith. He has correct faith. He has correct theology. And James says, well, even the demons have that. Demons have correct theology. Did you know that? Demons know the truth. Uh, take uh, Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus goes and there's this demon-possessed person. What's your name? Legion, for we are many. This guy has many demons inside of him. What does the demon say? The moment Jesus arrives, the the demons freak out and they say, What do you want with us, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Think about that for a moment. Think about the theology there. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. There's no question. They know that. Uh, They know that Jesus has the power to torment them. They know that Jesus is going to torment them at an appointed time. They know that. They they have correct theology. That's not a question. If correct theology saved you, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have it, but if correct theology saved you, devil would be first in line to go to heaven. That's, that's, That's not it. There's something more than is required than having correct theology. Believing in the right God. Um... The, the reformers used to say that there are three elements to saving faith. At least three elements to saving faith. When they were talking about the nature of true and living faith, they said, first of all, there has to be information. There has to be a message. There has to be data. We need, there has to be something to believe. Okay? <laughs> there, there are people who say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. As though you're saved through sincerity. No, you're saved through Christ. But there has to be a body of information to believe. You know, Christ and his death on the cross for, for sins, or the resurrection and so forth. There has to be something that we believe in. So they said, well, first of all, there has to be information. Okay. Second of all, they said, there has to be assent. There, you have to agree that that information is true. You have to believe that the information is true. If I said to you, uh, Athens is the capital of Greece, and you say, yes, I affirm that. Okay, yes. You've heard the information, and you believe that it's true. You have to have that too. So, in order to have saving faith, you have to hear the truth, you have to hear about the gospel, and you have to believe that it's true. But... Even the demons know that. The demons know the truth about God. The demons know that Jesus is the Savior. They know that Jesus came to die on the, uh, on the cross to pay for our sins. They know that. So there's something more that is required. And that is personal trust in Christ. See, the demons know all about Christ, but they hate Him. They despise Him. They don't love the Gospel. It's a matter of throwing yourself on Christ, saying, without you I have no hope, and trusting in Him personally, and loving Him. That is what's required. I I heard someone who brought a very good example of this, um, to explain it. He said, to to explain those three points, and he said, he would bring a, a chair in front of his class, and he would say to everyone, this is a chair. Okay? That's the information. Okay? First of all, you got that. So you would say, do you believe that this is a chair? Yes, I believe it's a chair. Um, Do you believe that this chair can hold your weight? Look at it. Yes, I believe this chair can hold my weight. Okay. Is this chair holding your weight right now? They'd be like, no. (laughs) Obviously not. Why not? Well, I'm not sitting in it. 
Exactly. It's not a matter of simply knowing that it's a chair or that it is able to hold you. The question is, are, have you put yourself in that chair? It's not a matter of knowing who Christ is. It's a matter of leaning on Him, trusting on Him. Putting your life in His hands and saying, yes, you have to save me. I can't save myself. And there are so many people who say, I have faith. I believe. I believe the gospel. I believe in Christ. I believe all these things. But they don't rely upon Christ. They, their life is not dependent they believe it's not dependent upon him. And he says, look, demons believe that. And they tremble. Throws that off there on the side. And they tremble. At least when demons... Demons' faith at least has some effect on them. They tremble. You have so many people who say they have faith and it has no effect on them. Unlike the demons. Verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, he's upset. Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Do you want to know? Do you want to see? I'll show you. Let me give you an example. And the first example that he brings is Abraham. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? He refers to Abraham as our father. Uh, just as a quick side note. Um, this may be because he is writing to people who are Israelite Christians. And so they've all descended from Abraham. Or it could simply be a reference to the fact that as Galatians 3 says that those who believe in Christ are the true children of Abraham. It's not a matter of having the blood of Abraham. It's a matter of having the faith of Abraham. So this could be a reference to the, faith, the fact that Abraham is the father of all believers. Um, and he says, wasn't Abraham justified by works and we, we talked about this last week I'm not going to get into it again justified can have two meanings it can have the meaning of being declared to be just or it can have the meaning of being shown to be just proven to be just and that is what James is talking about here because the context itself is about a demonstration of our faith so wasn't Abraham shown, proven to be just through his works when he offered up Isaac he showed that he had true faith living faith when he offered up Isaac you remember the story. God speaks to Abraham. Uh, he gives him promises. Abraham believes. Abraham gets saved. He tells him that he's going to have a son. He's really old at this point. He's like 75. He doesn't have the son until he's 100. 25 years later. Finally has the son. And he is ecstatic. He, he loves his boy Isaac. And then one day, out of the blue, we don't know when, how old Isaac was exactly at this point, but so it's at least not like 30 years later. God says to Abraham, take your son. Take your unique son, the child of the promise. Take your son whom you love and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to me. Now, if you're Abraham... You're thinking, I don't get this at all. Uh, I mean, first of all, God told me that through Isaac uh, was going to be the line for the Messiah. All the nations of the world would be blessed through the seed that would come through Isaac. And now he's telling me to kill him. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Not to mention the fact that God abhors human sacrifice. I don't get it. I don't get it. But... The book of Hebrews tells us, this is interesting, it doesn't say it in Genesis, it says in Hebrews. The book of Hebrews says that Abraham believed that God was able to raise him from the dead. Even though no resurrection had ever happened up until that point, he knew that God had power over life and death, and he said, okay, if God says that the promise is going to be through him, and he's telling me to kill him, I guess he's going to raise him from the dead after I kill him. And he was willing to do it. He was going ahead, and he got up and went. And James is saying, is there any question that Abraham had faith? Well, how do we know? Because of what he did. His works. He, he didn't just get up and say, I believe in God. He had an active faith. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. He was going to do it and God stopped him. That's faith. How do I know? Because of what he did. Look at verse 22. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Abraham's faith was not mere intellectual ascent, it was an active faith. And it says, by works, his faith was made perfect. 
Now, we've got to deal with this here really quick. He is not saying that Abraham's faith was a dead faith and it became alive when he tried to sacrifice Isaac. He's not saying that. He's not saying, well, his faith was incomplete and it was, became perfect because of the works that he did. The Greek word there where it says it became perfect, the Greek word is eteliothi. And it comes from the word telos, which means an end. His faith reached an end, reached a goal through his works. Uh, to, I want to explain this to you, and I want you to see a verse I think will help us out. Go a few verses to 1 John. Keep your place in James and just turn to 1 John chapter 4 for a moment. I think this will help us understand what James is talking about. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, John is talking about the love of God and how we love one another and, and, and so forth. And he says in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If, listen to this, if we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. Notice God's love has been perfected when we love one another. Does that mean that God's love was incomplete? Does that mean that God's love was imperfect and it became perfect when you and I started loving one another? No. God saves us. God's love for us in saving us has a goal. It has many goals, but it has one goal. And one of the goals was for us to love one another. He saves us. We love Him when we love one another. And when we love one another, His goal is reached. Okay, when it says His love was perfected. Okay, so if you go back to James, his point is, God saved Abraham with a goal. He saves all of us with a goal, and that is to do good works. You're saved by faith, not by works. You're saved unto good works. He saved Abraham with a goal, and that goal was to see those good works. And his faith reached that goal by his works. When he was willing to offer Isaac. And he says the same thing in verse 23. Look at this. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What's he doing here? He's taking us back to Genesis 15. That's when Abraham was saved. Genesis 15, when he believed God, and God justified him through faith. And he's saying, but that wasn't the end of it. His faith was fulfilled. It reached a fulfillment through its works. It reached a goal. Imagine God planting a tree. The tree is alive. The tree is real. But it has a goal to produce fruit. And it reaches that goal when it produces fruit. That's what happened with Abraham. He was shown to be a just man. And have true faith when he offered up Isaac. Verse 24. You see then that a man is justified by works. And not by faith only. A man is shown to be just. Shown to have true faith. Not simply by giving an empty confession of faith. Oh, I believe. But through works. That is his whole point. One last small example. Verse 25. says, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messages and sent them out another way? You know the story of Rahab. You can find it in Joshua chapter 2. The people are ready to enter the land, cross over the Jordan. The first city they're going to attack is Jericho. And Rahab lives in Jericho and the Jews send in some spies to spy out the land and they end up in her house. And she says to them, man, you know, the, people, the inhabitants of Jericho are terrified. Because they know that your God is a powerful God. He, know, he knows what your God has done thus far to bring you here. And so, man, we're terrified. And she says, I know that your God is the true God. Your God is the God of heaven and earth. And so what does she do? Does she just say, anyhow, let's take you off to the authorities now. <laughs> she says, she understands that these are the people of God. And so she protects them. When the authorities come looking for them, she hides them. What's the point? The point is not just saying, well, I believe, and oh well, I don't do anything about it. Do you realize that Rahab risked her life? She risked her life 
by protecting these people. That was a real faith. That was a faith that acted upon its confession. So he concludes, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It's pretty self-explanatory. Let me close by saying this. As I mentioned in the beginning, James is not saying, do good works, do good works, do good works, so your dead faith can become living. That's not his point. He's saying, do you have the right kind of faith? Do you have a faith that saves? Not a faith that is like that of demons. Not a faith that does not have works, but a true and living and active faith. And the scripture tells us all the time to examine ourselves. Uh, Paul said, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Uh, Peter said, make your calling and election sure. Do you have the kind of faith where you would risk your life for what you believe? Like Rahab. Do you have the kind of faith where you are willing to give up what you love the most, like Abraham? Do you have a faith that is active? Or is it just words? Is it just empty words, I believe, and nothing more? We are to examine ourselves, make our calling and election sure. Don't wait till you die to find out. It's going to be too late. So make sure you're in a right relationship with God. Look at your life. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.